Howard would have to have done something unforgivable. At the end of it, he might never be able to practice law again. Is that supposed to be me? I, uh... Hey everybody, and thank you for watching another video. My name is Merge, and welcome to the Breaking Bad What If series that I call the Heisenverse, a series where I make a change somewhere in the Breaking Bad or Better Call Saul timeline and explore how that one change ripples throughout the entire universe. And in this video, spoiler alert, but we explore the impact of Howard Hamlin's death and how different the world of Better Call Saul would have been if only Jimmy witnessed a fatal gunshot. Do you think that this will have an impact on our favorite legal counsel? Well, the answer is yes, but I'm sure that you're here for the how and the why. So before we get started, if you could leave a like on this video to support the channel, I'd appreciate it. Now, let's get into it. After his speech about dedicating his life to exposing Kim and Jimmy for everything that they've done, Howard leaves the apartment satisfied with having the last word. But the sad thing about his confrontation is, even he knows that it's just an empty threat. Because what can he really do against Kim and Jimmy? His reputation is ruined, his marriage is failing, and he has nobody that can combat the force that is Wexler and Goodman together or separate. And before Saul closes the door, he says, Hey Howard, I'm fine, Jimmy, or Saul, or whatever your name is. Howard says stumbling away without looking back while taking a swig of the bottle that he brought for Jimmy, but he ends up taking it for himself. And hearing the sound of Jimmy's door close while he's walking down the corridor, Howard, without paying attention, would accidentally bump shoulders with a mustached man with his hands in his jacket pockets who's headed in the opposite direction. I am so sorry, I didn't, I didn't see you there. Howard says apologetically, now stumbling over his words. Hey man, don't worry about it. Just drive safe, okay? The man says giving a wink with a friendly smile and he continues to go about his way. And that man we come to find out is Lalo Salamanca, who's actually on his way to Kim and Jimmy's apartment right now. And Howard would just go about his night getting drunk inside his car outside of Kim and Jimmy's parking lot because for one, he's well aware that he's in no condition to drive. And two, he doesn't have anything better to do. And besides, what's the worst that can happen? Back at the apartment with Kim, Jimmy, and Lalo, without Howard being there, things play out more or less the same with Lalo still intimidating them with a straight face and his gun drawn, but no shot would be fired that night with Jimmy talking Lalo out of sending him to Gus's house and instead volunteering Kim. Sent her. What? So after a tear-filled goodbye, Kim leaves the house nearly forgetting her shoes before making her way down to Lalo's car. And Howard, who's still in the parking lot drinking and listening to his classical jazz, would see Kim leaving the apartment building in a hurry and drives off in a random car. Which to Howard, it's not abnormal to have a rental, so he pays it no mind. But then, shortly after, that same mustache man that he bumped into earlier gets into Jimmy's car. And Howard knows for a fact that that's Jimmy's car. But he's never seen that man before. And it gets Howard thinking. And for some reason, he just has this feeling. Call it a sixth sense, or maybe it's the liquid courage that he's feeling, but he's just compelled to go back into Jimmy's apartment. And before you say anything in the comments, I want you to compare this moment of, let's call it clairvoyance, to when Gus had hid the gun in the lab or loosened up the power cables just for reasons. Not yet. So once Howard makes it upstairs, he would find the door to Kim and Jimmy's apartment unlocked, and when he enters, he is surprised to see Jimmy who's gagged and tied to a chair that's now been knocked over. And the two would give each other looks of utter shock and confusion, because for Jimmy, Howard is the last person that he would have expected to see at this time. And as he approaches, Howard says, Jimmy, what, what the hell happened to you? As he goes to ungag him, and once his mouth was free, Jimmy says in full panic, Howard, you have to get me out of this. He's coming back and we have to get to Kim. Jimmy says struggling in his bondage, and as Howard begins to untie him, he would just say while trying to get an understanding of the situation, wait, wait, who's coming back, and why are you even tied to a chair? It's a long story, Howard, but right now is not the time, but I swear to you, I will tell you everything, but first, please, we have to get out of here now. And Howard suddenly stops untying Jimmy, and he would just say, no. And Jimmy says almost frozen with shock, no? What, what do you mean, no? I mean, no, Jimmy. I'm not helping you do anything until you tell me what's going on, right now. I don't care if you're tied to a chair. Who knows, you probably deserve it, but you're not going anywhere with me until I get some answers. Now, the truth. Howard demands now standing up and towering over Jimmy. And with no position to bargain, Jimmy grits his teeth, letting out a sigh of defeat, and begins to tell Howard the long and uncomfortable truth. And at the same time while that's going on, after Kim was intercepted by Mike, she says in the nicest possible way where to find Lalo. Lalo is going to kill Jimmy. Mike then leaves Kim with Victor and Gus while he and a few guys would be making their way over to Kim and Jimmy's apartment for Lalo. And riding with him is Mike's top guy, who for this video, we're just gonna call him Gary. And Gary will be important to this video later. But for now, Mike makes a call pulling Tyrus and his guys from the laundromat because they were closer, and he would have them get in position and watch the place until Mike arrives. And less than five minutes later, when Mike, Gary, and a handful of guys meet up with Tyrus, they're updated on the situation by one of the guys on the roof with a sniper rifle, saying to Mike on the radio, Mike, I've had eyes on the place for over 10 minutes, but I can't get a clear shot of Salamanca from where he's standing. But I can confirm that the lawyer's still alive and he's looking to have a conversation with him. 
And following that information, Mike would give the go-ahead for his men to proceed inside. We don't want to spook the neighbors. But as they converge on the apartment, we pick back up with Jimmy, who's still bound to a chair and just finished telling Howard everything. And Howard stands there flabbergasted at everything he was just told. From the elaborate D-Day plans, to Jimmy's connection to the cartel, and he just responds saying, Jesus, Jimmy, just why? What is there to be gained from all this? And Jimmy says with sympathy and regret, Howard, I just want to say I never meant for it. And that would be the last word said because for the next two seconds, everything changes. Mike and his men would breach the door, but before anyone could react, Howard, who's still facing Jimmy, wouldn't see the men enter behind him. But Jimmy would see it all, and before his very eyes, he would witness in almost slow motion Mike and Gary coming in first with their guns drawn. And right away, Mike would notice that it's Howard and he would lower his gun. But Gary wouldn't notice in time, and because of how he's standing over a chair bound Jimmy, Gary takes a shot, dropping Howard. Not too dissimilar to the original. <laughs> And Jimmy, while struggling in his chair, tries to break free as he screams out in horror at Howard's dead body that just fell right in front of him. But in spite of Jimmy screaming and his anger at Gary, Mike walks over to Jimmy to put the gag back over his mouth to stop his screaming, and he grabs him by the shoulders to calm him down before saying, Hey, listen to me. She's fine. He says referring to Kim. Now we can't change what just happened here, but we're gonna have to deal with that later. Right now, I'm gonna take the gag out of your mouth, and I need you to tell me where he went. Jimmy nods his head with watery eyes as Mike removes the gag, and Jimmy says, I don't know where he went, but he left with my car not too much longer after Kim did. That's all I know. Mike would then stand the chair upright, directing his attention at Gary, saying, Me and you are going to have a long talk later, but for now, just cut him loose and get the place prepped for a cleanup. Got it? And Gary just acknowledges with a head nod, saying, You got it, Mike. And by the time Mike arrives at the laundromat, he finds Gus at the bottom of the construction pit with a dead Lalo next to him. And for the most part, things play out more or less the same with Gus and Mike, but this is where our story diverges. Because yes, Howard did die like in the original, but the person most affected by his death was arguably Kim. And with her not being around to witness and have that additional trauma, Jimmy would have to carry Howard's death all by himself. And what this does is add an extra layer to Jimmy's already complex morality. So when Mike returns to Kim and Jimmy's apartment, Gary has already emptied out the refrigerator and brought a replacement. So while they load Howard's body into the refrigerator, Mike and Jimmy talk in his room and they discuss the story for Howard. And Mike explains, so this is what happened. He showed up to your apartment last night and he was chemically altered. Something felt off. And then he left shortly after. That's all you know. Mike then pauses for a moment looking at Jimmy before snapping out of his daze. Yeah, 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 I got it. That's, that's all I know. Jimmy says shaking his head in agreement, still dealing with Howard's death that happened just hours ago. Mike then continues saying, as for your wife and the rest of the world, they're going to hear about his car being found on the beach a couple states away. There will be drugs in the upholstery and a search for his body will happen, but he will never be found. And Jimmy just continues to look up and listen as he slowly comes to grips with the reality of the situation. And that is that Howard's death will always be a lie, a lie that he alone has to carry for the rest of his life. And nobody, not even Kim, can ever know the truth. And when the apartment was cleaned up and Howard's body was disposed of, Mike would then bring Kim home, who is still uneasy about nearly killing an innocent man. But when she re-enters the apartment, she wouldn't even notice a thing out of place as her only concern was being reunited with her husband. And as the two hug and embrace, Kim holds Jimmy while also closing her eyes, breathing in a sigh of relief that this nightmare is finally over. But for Jimmy, it would just be the beginning. The next few days, Jimmy and Kim would stay in a hotel wanting to take a break from everything and everybody and just enjoy each other. And during this time, Kim seems to be adjusting back to normal way more than Jimmy is, and that's something that she takes notice of, but doesn't bring up right away. It's only until they turn on the TV and catch a missing person report of their former colleague, Howard Hamlin, showing his car parked out on the beach with drug paraphernalia inside and urging anyone that if they have any information to come forward. And Saul watching TV tries to hide his panic, unable to say a word about the breaking news. But Kim, who is clearly just finding out about this now, turns her attention to Jimmy, who she can see is visibly disturbed, and she says to him, Jimmy. I don't want to ask, but I have to. Do you know anything about this? She says pointing at the TV. Jimmy stays quiet for a moment, avoiding eye contact with Kim before saying, I mean, you saw him. The guy was practically a wreck when he was at our house the other night. I mean, maybe he went to Belize. He says now looking at the ground, still unable to face Kim. B Belize. Kim questions being slightly confused, and Jimmy says, you know, Belize, making a gun reference with his hands to his head. And Kim looking at Saul, knowing that he's not telling the truth, just nods her head while facing back towards the TV and says, Belize. Okay. And as the two continue to watch TV, that night a seed of tension would start growing between the two of them. Fast forward to Howard's funeral and Jimmy is getting grilled by Howard's ex-wife Cheryl about her husband's mysterious demise. And Kim intervenes the same way of telling her the story of walking in on Howard snorting something. And he was snorting something. And after making Cheryl cry, Kim again directs her attention at Jimmy, giving him a look of disdain. And before he can notice, she looks away and muttering under her breath, Psh, Belize. 
but she said it just loud enough for Jimmy to hear, and although he heard it clear as day, he would just pretend that he didn't as the two continue to mingle with others around the building. And as the two head out to the parking garage, Jimmy now brings up what Kim said earlier, saying, Correct me if I'm wrong, but did I hear you say Belize? What, what's, what's that all about? But Kim just looks at Jimmy with a blank expression, but says nothing. Instead, goes in for a long, passionate kiss, and still without a word, she gets into a car and just drives away, leaving Jimmy standing alone in a parking garage. The next day at the restaurant that Kim has her consultations at, she sits alone staring down at divorce papers, weighing her options. Because on one hand, she can just tear up those papers and go with the lie that Jimmy's telling her about Howard and maybe everything will be fine. But on the other hand, because he never told her about what really happened in the desert during the episode Bagman, maybe if he did, then what happened with Lalo at their house wouldn't have happened. And she thinks back on why she got married to Jimmy in the first place, which was for this exact reason. Okay, what if I have the urge to not tell you something, but I tell you and you don't like what you hear. I just wanna know what's going on. We pick up later on that evening with Kim smoking the cigarette on the balcony waiting for Jimmy. And when he pulls in, they make eye contact for a moment before Jimmy rushes upstairs. And when he comes inside, Jimmy starts telling Kim about how great of a day that he had going on about this public masturbator case that he won. And then he asks Kim, so how was your day? And Kim takes a deep breath while shaking off her nerves before saying, Jimmy, I love you, but I need you to tell me the truth right now what happened to howard i know you know wait what what are you talking about how how would i even know jimmy says struggling to find the words to say as every ounce of happiness is drained from the room and slowly replaced with an awkward tension and kim asks again but this time with her voice cracking jimmy what happened to howard and jimmy feeling the same way he felt when howard asked him for the truth earlier in the story would slowly swallow his spit and instinctively lie to her saying kim honestly hand on the bible I have no idea what happened to Howard. And besides, what what doesn't even matter at this point? And hearing Jimmy's response, Kim looks at him with visible disappointment before looking down at the ground and sniffling, and she says in a whispered tone, I want a divorce. Wait, 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 I'm sorry. Kim, you want a what? Jimmy says in confusion, but Kim says it again, but this time looking back up at Jimmy. I said I want a divorce. I can't do this anymore, Jimmy. If you want to live your life behind lies, go for it. But I, I just can't live like that. Kim says, fighting through her tears. Kim, where, where's all this coming from? What, what lies? Jimmy says in a confusing tone while trying to de-escalate the situation. But Kim says, wiping her tears with almost no emotion. So you're seriously going to look me in the eyes and say you don't know what I'm talking about? Fine. Kim says, walking back to her room to finish packing and slamming the door behind her. Once again, leaving Jimmy alone. But this time in the living room as he goes back and forth with himself about whether he should tell Kim the truth or not. And hearing the sound of plastic bags being filled and zippers from suitcases being closed in the other room, Jimmy decides that Kim hating him for lying to her is better than her living with the truth and risking her safety. Because although she's likely to be more capable than he is, the last thing he wants for her is to be in the game. So if this cost him his marriage, at least he'll know that she'll be safe in the end. And as the years go by, the Wexler and Goodman duo has already finalized their divorce papers and went their separate ways. And even though Kim knows that Jimmy has something to do with Howard's death, without a body or evidence, Unless Jimmy tells her, she'll never truly know. And it's because of that lie that caused her to resent her now ex-husband, who has since been on the run for his involvement in the drug empire, and at this time thought to have been dead. So when she gets a call from work from a man that we all know as Gene Takovic, but for her, it's the voice of Saul Goodman, after bragging about how he's still getting away with it, she would just plainly ask, Jimmy, what happened to Howard? Oh my god, this again? After all these years? Kim. Howard is dead. I don't know how many times or how many ways I can say it to you. Gene says getting annoyed. Well, how did he die? Kim says with a quick response. Gene then exhales in the phone receiver and says, Fine. You want to hear it? Fine. That night with Lalo, Howard, Howard was killed by one of Mike's guys in front of me. Kim remains silent on the phone covering her mouth so her cries can't be heard as Gene continues. I told him about D-Day. I told him about Chuck. I told him about everything. And right as I was apologizing, boom. He was gone. And yeah, I could have told you the truth and let you carry that burden with me, but I didn't want that for you, Kim. So there you have it. The truth in all its glory. And if you want to yell it from the treetops, more power to you. They can only hang me once. So see if I care. Gene says arrogantly, but he's met with silence. And after a few seconds pass, Gene says, hello, Kim, can you, can you say something? And without warning, she just hangs up, infuriating Gene to the point of destroying a phone booth. 
A couple months later, Gene Takovic would be outed as Saul Goodman, but when he's given this phone call, he would reach out to Bill Oakley wanting to be represented by his old rival. And once it was time for negotiations, Saul would use every trick in his book to lower his sentence, and he would get him down to seven and a half years, and he would use his quote sweetener to use Howard's death to get that pint of ice cream every Friday for the duration of his sentence. Bluebell mint chocolate chip ice cream every Friday for the duration. Are you kidding? And the biggest difference between Kim knowing Howard's death in this version would be the fact that she wasn't there to witness it. So even if she did decide to go to Cheryl with what she knows about Howard's death, it wouldn't really do much of anything other than help Jimmy get his ice cream. You don't understand. It's really good ice cream. So during the trial, Saul lets Oakley do all the talking and he relaxes to the point of putting his arms behind his head. And within 30 minutes, Saul Goodman receives a seven and a half year sentence with the possibility of early release. Two months into that seven and a half year sentence, Saul receives his first visit from none other than Kim Wexler. And the two share a cigarette for old time's sake with Kim saying with a smile, I can't believe you got him down to seven and a half years, as she blows smoke looking at Jimmy. And he responds jokingly saying, who knows, maybe with good behavior, it could be six. And as they both look at each other sharing a moment, they recognize that this is the start of a brand new chapter. Hey everybody and thank you so much for watching another video and I really hope you enjoyed another story from the Heisenverse and with this one I wanted to see if I can make a full 360 on Kim and Jimmy's relationship where it's not so ambiguous if they get back together in the end and I think I did a pretty good job all things considered but that's just me but now I want to hear from you guys what do you think of this version of Better Call Saul where it's more of a happy ending for Kim and Jimmy do you agree disagree like dislike whatever it is let me know down below in the comments and if you want to have access to videos 24 hours before anyone else and have your name shouted out at the end of each video consider becoming a member of the Heisenverse but if not I appreciate appreciate you just for being here and a link for my discord will be in the description below so you can be a part of the conversation. But that'll do it for me on this video. Feel free to comment down below thoughts, opinions, recommendations, whatever it is and I'll do my best to respond. Until then, my name is Merge. Later.